Thank you for downloading this podcast from Emmanuel Church Lurgan. At Emmanuel, our vision is to help rewrite the story of Craig Avon, Ireland and the nations with the good news of the Kingdom of God. We hope you enjoy listening to this message. Welcome to Lurgan Portadown, Cara, Shalom, anybody else, or to our family, any of our online visitors, you're so welcome. This, as I say, is our last Sunday of sort of churches together over July and August. We did a summer theme called Come Back Stronger, um, and uh, we, we based that around four words that we felt the Lord was really speaking to us. That was the word listen wisdom, serve, and prayer. And then after July was over, we sort of felt we would keep going in August, and we started to unpack the story of Nehemiah and building these four words into the story of Nehemiah. And Alan introduced that theme to us on the 2nd of August. And then Dave um, focused us around the word listen and how Nehemiah listened to, to the Lord. And then on the 16th, Chris focused us around the word wisdom, And last Sunday, Debbie focused us around the word serve with everybody using that little phrase of John Wimber that everybody gets to play. And and the whole idea of that was to um, help you understand that um, exile becomes a place of resurgent faith. And the whole idea of... um, deconstruction happening prior to reconstruction, which is obvious in the story of Nehemiah and the language that we've been using as well um, through the coronavirus lockdown. The fact that Nehemiah, uh, in that story, all the families are needed. Again, Debbie focuses around that last week. Everybody needs to do the work. And then the idea of covenant being renewed, the covenant of God's people. And of course, last year we did our covenant Sunday and spent almost probably a year um, teaching around the idea of practices uh, around covenant community. And so what I want to do as I close this off um, uh, today is talk a little bit about the word prayer and the principle of keeping watch as the city was rebuilt uh, and the walls were rebuilt because both prayer and work are needed and over and over again throughout the Bible we can do that. And so what I'd love you to do, I'd love you to grab your Bible um, and if you have a journal and a pen or a piece of paper and pen because we're just going to read the first 12 verses rather than read all the chapter. I will be referring to other verses in the chapter and have loads of other scriptures that I want to fire out to you this morning as well. So if you have a little uh, piece of paper and a pen, you could jot those down and um, you could read them at your own leisure then um, whenever you can. So let's read the word of the Lord in Nehemiah 4, verses 1 to 12. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews And in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from these heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it could break down their walls of stone. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their own insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sinbalat, Tobiah, and the Arabs and Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and that their gaps were being closed, they were very angry. And they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. 
Now, we know the Lord will bless the reading of his word. Father, we just pray that you'll bless this word and pray that you'll unfold to us the riches and beauty of it this morning and teach us practical applications to it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know to go into the context and um, uh, background of the book of Nehemiah. The guys in the previous month and the previous Sundays have done a phenomenal job in that. So you, by now you know the sort of context and background. The people are in the process of rebuilding the walls of uh, Jerusalem, this broken down city. Now it would have been very difficult and pretty backbreaking work, I would imagine, for those involved. But it was necessary for them to be safe from the attacks of the enemies. If this city was ever going to be a stronghold again, they were going to need to rebuild what had been broken down. Um, and they were going to have to worship God as the law commanded them to do. And as they labored to build the walls, they faced constant opposition uh, to their work. And they became weary and they became discouraged. But the beauty of this story is, is that they never stopped working due to the strategy of a very, very powerful leader called Nehemiah. And eventually they would complete the task and they would um, be victorious over their attackers. And in a way, you and I are, are wall builders as well. We build all kinds of walls uh, between the world and the things of God, walls that separate our lives from the ungodliness around us in every hand. We build walls that are designed to protect our people and things we love from outside attack and destruction. Um, and since this is true, since this is true, I'm sure you will agree with me, out of times, it's easy to get discouraged, all right? You can tend to lean that way. In the last five months, if you could write one word over it for me, I found it times of honing into God, but I found it very discouraging at times. I've struggled um, to fight through the discouragement of God's people not being able to come together in a holistic way. And so there are times when you grow weary in the battle and uh, uh, to build and all, to build all that God wants us to be. And I believe that there are some truths contained in chapter four here today that can help us remain strong and faithful and active in the struggle to build the necessary walls of life. All right, and there are probably three um, major ones that I'm going to unpack today. Um, Three major ones that I think every believer should grab hold of. And the first one is this. It'll be on your screen. You don't have to look for trouble. It knows where to find you. You don't have to look for trouble. It knows where to find you. Now, we all know this truth far too well. It seems that trouble stalks us as we travel through life. And of course, nowhere is this truer than the, in the work of the Lord. And if you're serving the Lord with any kind of fervency and dedication, you can be assured that trouble will arise. And the Bible's full of verses that remind us of this. Paul told this to young Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.12. He said, indeed, all who desire a live a go- to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That was the words of Paul to Timothy. And we know that it comes from without. We understand that. It will come in the form of mockery. We've seen that in the first three verses we we read, where these men started to mock um, people who were serving the Lord. So it comes from without. It comes in a form of mockery. It comes in a form of intimidation. We've seen that in verse 7 and 8. And those who don't know the Lord and don't understand maybe what we're doing, in a way we can understand that. We can we can almost expect that, all right? It's understandable because they they maybe don't comprehend what you're doing. And a, a godless or a, a godly life will always stand in rebuke to a godless life. So that's to be, to be expected. And we shouldn't be surprised when attacks come from without because Jesus told his disciples in John 15, he says, the world, if the world hates me, it's going to hit you also. All right. So, so we know it comes from without. But then the story reminds us that it comes from within in a form of deception, first and foremost. It says, meanwhile in Judah, verse 10, the strength of the laborers is giving out. These were the people of Judah talking like this. And there's so much rubble. They just got all negative. There's far too much rubble. We'll never be able to work through this. These people from the tribe of Judah, actually, God's chosen people were the first to complain about the work. And the reason, if you read on in the book, you'll find it's very apparent because when it comes to chapter 6, you'll find that these people had made an, al- an allegiance with Tobiah and Sanballat. And um, we, we would say they were in bed with the enemy. 
And it, so it comes in a form of deception, but it comes in a form of discouragement. Verse 12, it says, Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over. Do you ever have anybody chirping away at you, just chirping and chirping and chirping until it just gets you down? This is what happened. They came and, and these people they were dwelling Near the enemy, it tells us. Dangerous place to dwell. They were dwelling near and beside the enemy. And they're chipping on. And they're just creating discouragement all the time. Now, it rarely shocks us when when discouragement and, and, and attacks come from without. But when it arises from within, I don't know about you, but when, when it arises from within, it's devastating. It is devastating. And whether it comes in the form of deception with someone living with a life of hidden sin or in the form of discouragement when someone starts to question our motives or question the motives of the church you love, it hurts deeply because it can cause us, it really can cause us to deviate from the course. Um, and we shouldn't be surprised because Jesus had people on his team who discouraged him. We, we know this from, from Matthew 16, verse 21, where, where, where Peter actually was discouraging him from going to Jerusalem. And, and Jesus had to be very stern um, with him and speak very sternly to him. And we see Thomas in John 11, 16. Um, it's a kind of a little weird verse, but it looks like he's mocking He's, he's mocking Jesus, all right? So, so Jesus knew that deception would come from within. So remember, number one, that trouble has no problem finding you. The second thing I'd love to talk to you about is that the best form of defense is offense. The best form of defense is offense, right? That when trouble came, Nehemiah went on the offensive. This guy, he is something else. When he, to, to, to strengthen the defense, he went on the offense. He went after them. He took matters into his own hands. He was a master strategist, and he strategized a very powerful plan, all right? And he encourages five attitudes that I think need to be implemented in the church today, especially as we come back together, especially as we come back together with all the weird systems and things that we have to do, and some agree and some don't agree, but we're trying to keep the law and follow law and order and, and hear God as well. So please pray for us. But the five attitudes that, that Nehemiah instructed in the church were these. The first one, I love this. The first one is be prayerful. Be prayerful. Verses 4 and 5. Here's the first thing he says. As soon as they, they, they start to discourage, Nehemiah gets to prayer. He says, Hear, O God, all of life, all of life, especially the battles we face in the realm of faith should be bathed in the prayers of God's people. We should pray. Now, if you've got your pen in your journal and you want some prayer verses, let me fire you through. Write, write these down and you can read them at your own time. Philippians 4, 6. 1 Peter 4, 7, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, Colossians 4, 2, Luke 18, 1, Matthew 7, 7, James 4, 2, just to mention a few. Those are just a few in the New Testament. And, and so the thing about the, uh, all of our attitudes, especially as we come back, and if ever we needed the church to pray, if ever we needed our intercessors to rise, if ever we needed our council, our prayer teams to pray, it's now. We need to be prayerful. The second thing that, um, that, that Nehemiah encouraged these guys to do was to be alert. Be alert. Verse 9. We prayed, here's what he said, and set a guard day and night. Prayer should always be coupled with watchfulness. We should learn how to watch and pray. Let's have alertness to the tactics and antics of the enemy because he's a deceptive and he's a slippery foe. First Peter 5, 8, there's another verse for you. It says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. We are not to be ignorant of the devil's devices. Ephesians 6, 11, Paul encouraged us to stand against the wiles of the devil. And of course, Jesus commands his disciples in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. If ever we needed to pray, it's now. But if ever we needed to be alert, it's now. We need to have our senses around us. Bobby Leach, he's not a 
a, he wasn't a, a relative of Chris and Debbie's because his name spelled different. But Bobby Leach was a stunt man who survived a trip in a barrel over the Niagara Falls in 1910, who later slipped in an orange peel, banged his head and died as a result. We need to be alert. We need to be alert. We can't let our guard down at this moment in time. Third thing he said was you need to be prepared. Verses 16 to 20. These people were prepared uh, to be prepared for war as they were for work. They were ready to, at a moment's notice, so they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand. They had learned how to work and fight. And while we live our lives, we are to be ready to work for Jesus and to war for him at the same time. And, and this requires in us dressing up in the whole armor of God. This is what Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in 6, 10, chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. The emphasis is in the whole armor of God. He wants us to wear all the armor all the time so that we're ready to stand for him when trouble finds us. And too many aren't willing to wear all the armor all the time. And, and if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're gonna make it in this, day and age, you're going to have to learn how to wear all the armor all of the time. And then the fourth thing was be united. Be united. Verses 19 to 23, they were separated along the wall and as the, the work went on, the people got more and more separated. And so what Nehemiah did was he got a trumpet player or a trumpet blower and, and he would have him stand beside him. And there were those times that he knew that need, he knew that people needed to be unified. He would get the trumpet to blast and the people would come together. Sadly, many are far from one another in the church today and the coronavirus and COVID-19 has created all kinds of dissensions, all kinds of, 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 of opinions that are just, are, the devil is just using to divide the church far from one another. And Paul writes to the church in Ephesus in 4.3, and he says, you need to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We've got to fight for this. We need to be in unity. And unity demands us to be in tune with the same person. And when we are all in tune with Jesus, there will be harmony in the church. When we're not taking this side or reading this book or reading this blog or following this Facebook page, whenever we get into in tune with Jesus and we're all looking to him, then there will be harmony in the church. Have you ever wondered why the, the geese fly in a V formation? Now, this has been interesting because I, I worked on this um, at the beginning of the week. And then yesterday, just yesterday, David Legg came up with the same story. He's preaching in Fermanagh Christian Fellowship this morning. He'll be telling this story, I, I would imagine, because it just seems pretty. And then there was a few prophetic words that were saying the same. So there's something on this at the moment, all right? For years, uh, aerodynamic specialists wondered why geese flew in a, a V formation. And two engineers calibrated in a wind tunnel and um, what happens in such a V formation. Each goose, in flapping his wings, creates an upward lift for the goose that follows. That's why they actually change direction. One leads and leads for a while and then there's another one comes in. And the upward lift of the, the one that, that's heading up in front gives an upward lift to the one behind and the one behind that and the one behind that. And when all the geese do their part in the V formation, these two engineers calibrated that the whole flock has a 71% greater flying range than if, than if each bird flew alone. I think that's incredible. Each depends on the other to get to its destination. Something else actually I loved, when the goose behind if there's a goose that begins to lag behind, this is what they tell us, that the others honk it back into place. <laughs> they honk it back into place. Now, now, I think we could learn something from God's animal creation. The church needs to fly in a spiritual V formation, and we need to honk one another into steadfastness. We, and, and it must be at least, it must be at least 71% easier to live a faithful Christian life flying with the flock as opposed to going it alone. And if the enemy has tried to isolate you and tell you that you don't need the church, I'm telling you, the church isn't perfect, but it's, it's a bit like Noah's Ark. It mightn't be perfect on the inside. It might be smelly and all of that, but it's a whole lot better than what's going on outside. And so Hebrews, the writer to Hebrews in 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider one another. Let us consider one another. 
I hear even people who say, I'm not wearing a mask, I'm not wearing a mask. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling and gathering of ourselves together. Don't forsake it. Whatever you do, don't forsake it. As we try to gather again, don't forsake it. Don't think there's something better. Don't think a lackadaisical life is better. We've got to get in and back together. And then fifthly, he says, we need to be determined. Verses 6 and 23. This was a people determined, determined to do the work of the Lord. They could not be sidetracked by the attacks from without or from within. There were a people, I love this little phrase, with a mind to work. Give me a man or a woman. Give me a family with a mind to work. And when t- trouble arises in the wall building process, these people have a determination that's greater than the opposition. And we need a determination that beats every opposition. A heart that is steadfastly minded to do the will of the Lord regardless of the situation at hand will always win the day. And here's the secret. The secret lies in what has our attention. The secret lies in what we look at. All right. Elijah became discouraged when he saw, when he looked at what Jezebel was up to in 1 Kings 19. Peter became discouraged in Matthew 6, 14, 30 when he looked at the storm. If we can determine to keep our eyes off the storm and on the Savior, then we'll win. The writer to Hebrews in 12, 1 and 2 says this, therefore, now we know that therefore is hinging back to chapter 11, that great chapter of faith and all the heroes and all the people who have, who have gone before us, all our, our, our families and friends that are in glory. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely. One of the versions says, the, the, the sins that so easily beset us, so easily trip us up. He said, let us lay them aside and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. Look into Jesus. Look into Jesus. Not looking to what um, every Joe Bloggs is saying. Looking unto Jesus who is the perfecter, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I tell you, it'll go a long way towards securing the victory in our lives. I think we, we need to be more determined to succeed for the glory of God rather than to, to fail. Let's be determined. And remember, trouble has a way of finding you. Some things are, are, are remember that the best defense is a good offense. And lastly, as we bring this to a conclusion, some things are just worth fighting for. Some things are just worth, there was so much at stake for these people. They were fighting for, for more than their lives, and so are we. So are we. And can I say to you that our faith is worth fighting for? Here's what, here's what Nehemiah said in verse 14. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord. Don't let fear rule you. Fear isn't of God. Fear is of the enemy. Don't let fear rule you. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. Our faith is worth fighting for. I say we have a faith that's worth fighting for and we need to, God is still looking for people who will worship him in spirit and truth. That's John 4, 24. And he wants us to be ready to fight for our right to worship his way. Don't allow the enemy to silence your praise. Don't allow the enemy to empty our altars. Don't allow the enemy to extinguish our testimony. We need to fight for what we have, and we need to fight for what we've left. Revelation 3.2, he says, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. And we need to recover that which we've lost and come back stronger. Revelation 2, let's return to our first love. He reminds the church at Ephesus. We need to return because our faith is worth fighting for. Do you know what? Our families are worth fighting for. Our families, hear what he says? He says in this verse, um, fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes, friends, and our families are in trouble. We need to fight the good fight of faith for them. We need to bathe them in prayer. We need to soak them in the word. We need to battle this old enemy tooth and nail to protect them if necessary. And of course, I would remind you that your family, if you're a believer, is is more than those who just share your name and your bloodline. 
as believers, our other believers are our family. We're part of the family of God and someone are under attack today. And it's our duty to reach out to them and to love in the love of Jesus and help them in their battle. That's what Paul means when he's writing in, in Galatia, in Galatians 6 2, and he ta- tells us to bear one another's burdens. We're not to attack our wounded, but we're to love them and humbly restore them back into their place in the battle and on the wall. And sadly, many of us are are far too quick to write people off after one failure, aren't we? And that's not the way of unity, and it's certainly not the way of Christ. I wonder what the Lord could do with us if we were determined that we would all that be that we would all be what He has called us to be. What could He do with this church if we took a stand for the things of God like Nehemiah and refused to back down? What could He do if we determined to revive and protect our worship and come back stronger than we've ever been before and be the church in this area and see Craig Evan, the the, the, the story of this broken city uh, rewritten in the name of Jesus and see the, the lost redeemed and see people saved and brought back into line with the scripture. He took a determined Martin Luther and sparked the Reformation. He took a, a D.L. Moody and shook two continents. He took a, a boy named David to kill a giant um, with a rag and a rock and become a man after his own heart. He took a ragtag group of disciples and he turned the world upside down. What could he do with us? What could he do with us? That's why not only is our faith worth fighting for, and our families are worth fighting for, our future is worth fighting for, we need a determined to come back stronger, stronger than we've ever been as a church. You know, it's a, I've finished, but it's just a, a a powerful thing to read this story and see just the diligence of one man in leading a group of people to victory. Just the diligence of leadership. And I'd love you um, in the in the days ahead to pray for our leadership, to pray for the leadership of Lurgan and Portadown, for Cara and Shalom. I'd love you to do that. I'd love you to make it a, a point every day in your prayer, just to pray because wisdom is needed. We need, remember the four words, we need to listen like never before. We need the wisdom of God like never before. We need to pray like never before. And of course, we need to serve like never before. And if we do those things, I tell you, we will come back stronger. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior this morning, then I invite you to accept him as your Savior. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you don't know him, repent of your sin. The Bible says when we do that, repent of our sin and call on his name. He will come in and sup with you. Isn't that beautiful? And you with him. He will enter. He will enter. So let's do that this morning. If you're not sure how to do that, we have a helpline number. If you wanted to ring that, it's across your screen. Some of our prayer ministry people would be willing to pray for you and lead you in that. And um, yeah, I hope that uh, if you're not able to come back into church just yet, we will be keeping an online presence. We'll be back online each week, week by week. And uh but we're looking forward to our two services here in Lurgan, 9.30 and 12 o'clock um, next Sunday. May the Lord bless you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it. Thank you that it's, uh, it, it, it's strong and it's powerful and it's like a hammer that chisels into our very souls. And I pray, God, that you will speak into the hearts of men and women and boys and girls today. Those who don't know you would cry out, uh, for you to come into their lives and save them. Those who do know you and maybe have got a little bit discouraged would rise up today with a fresh determination to say, I want to live for Jesus. I want to serve him with my life. This we ask in the mighty name of Jesus. Thanks for being with us today. And the Lord bless you in Jesus' name. We hope you enjoyed listening to this podcast. For more information about our church and all that we do, please visit our website at emmanuel-church.co.uk.